All right, can you all still hear me? All right, so what we're gonna yes. do what we're gonna do for today is go over the physiology from the Engage Lab Manual. And I'm gonna just go over some of that physiology, tell you where I want you to study and all of that and define a few terms. So all of the information for the physiology test from this particular chapter is gonna, for this exercise is gonna come from this chapter, all right? After we're done that, I'm gonna pull up the models book. I'm gonna show you a few structures on the models. I don't necessarily go over every single thing on there. That's pretty much, you know, for your homework, but I will point out several of the items on there. Um, and then you just go and practice the work and, you know, use the Quizlet. I think I have the Quizlet link in the site. I'll have to go double check, but I'm pretty sure it's in there. So, you know, you should use it. All right, very good. All right, so let's get into this. The digestive system is involved with several things, one of which you know it digests your food. That's pretty simple, easy way to say it. But basically, the digestion of your food involves the breakdown of the food items in a couple of ways. So when you eat food items, you have to chew them up and you make them into the food item into smaller pieces, right? You physically break the food item down. So when food items are physically being broken down to smaller parts, it's called mechanical digestion. Or when the food items are being mixed up with fluid and then moved around the rest of the digestive system, we call that mechanical digestion because the food substances are being mechanically manipulated, right? But we also have in the digestive system many different enzymes that we have to cover. And enzymes are proteins that are involved in performing chemical reactions. And in the digestive system, they're involved in breaking down the molecules that are found in the food items that we're eating. So ultimately, we have six classes of nutrients. I'm not putting the six classes of nutrients on the test, but you should know what they are anyway. I'm sure you took nutrition already. We have three classes of nutrients that supply calories to all of the cells in our body. Sugar, which is carbohydrate, fats or lipids, and protein. Those are the only three types of, of molecules in our food that we actually extract energy from to make ATP. The other three classes of nutrients, which are not less important, but they don't supply energy for ATP production are vitamins, minerals, and water. So all of those nutrients are gonna be extracted from the foods that we eat. And in order for our cells to be able to use it, all of those molecules have to be broken down. All the bonds that bind all of all the bonds that bind all of the units together to make, say, a protein. You guys remember what makes up proteins, right? Amino acids. So in order for your cells to be able to use amino acids, as that example I'm picking out, our enzymes have to be able to break apart each amino acid from the large protein that we're consuming. That's called chemical digestion. So during chemical digestion, large complex molecules are chemically broken down into smaller subunits that our cells can take up from the blood and then use to do whatever they need to use them for. Some of those subunits are building blocks. So the cells can make, you know, whatever molecules they need to make. Some of those subunits are energy molecules that allow the cells to make ATP. Nutrients like minerals and vitamins are involved in many different chemical reactions. It's beyond the scope of this lecture to go into what vitamins and minerals do, but you know a few of them. You, you know a little bit about calcium and sodium and potassium and all of that. Um, so, and, and we learned about vitamin D, which is, you know, the vitamin involved in calcium homeostasis. So, we're gonna uh, talk about the enzymes that break down the molecules. I'm not gonna get into the chemistry behind how the cells are using it though, all right? So besides 
digesting your food items, either mechanically and chemically, throughout the entire digestive system. Your digestive system also moves the food through the system. It's involved in absorbing the nutrients that we need from that digested food item into the blood. And then it's involved in eliminating the waste products. So we go to the bathroom. So any unabsorbed molecules, excess molecules, or substances that we cannot chemically digest, which is called fiber, is all passed out of our body when we go to the bathroom as feces. So the digestive system is actually a hollow tube that starts at your mouth and ends at your anus. That entire tube is called the alimentary canal. The alimentary canal. So we have organs that make up that tube directly that are obviously part of the digestive system. And I'm going to tell you which ones they are. But we also have organs that lie on the outside of the tube, which are not part of the tube directly, but which still is involved in allowing the digestive system to work. For instance, salivary glands that we'll talk about produce saliva. Everybody knows that. Well, the glands lie on the outside of the tube. They produce a saliva product. And that saliva is then transported into your oral cavity via the salivary ducts. Well, we ha also have a liver, produces bile. We're going to learn about that. Bile is secreted from the liver through a bile duct into the small intestine. So the liver is not part of the tube, but it's still involved in digestion. The pancreas, gland that is both endocrine and exocrine. We learned about the endocrine part already, right? alpha cells, beta cells, delta and F cells. Well, in this chapter, we're concerned with not the pancreatic islets, but all the cells on the outside of those islets, which is about 98% of all the cells. And they form the acinus or the acini cells. Well, they produce all the digestive enzymes, a lot of them. And it's secreted from the pancreas via the pancreatic duct into the small intestine. So the salivary glands, the liver, the pancreas, these structures are part of the digestive system, but they're not part of the tube, in which case we call them accessory organs of digestion. So one of the goals in this chapter is to go over, as far as the physiology is concerned, go over the substances that some of these glands make. What are the enzymes? What's in saliva? What does the pancreas produce, right? What is in the stomach? So we're gonna talk about some of that. So we mechanically digest our food. That's just physically manipulating the food items uh, down to smaller pieces that can be managed. And we have chemical digestion, which is gonna involve many enzymes in order to break the molecules down to their individual components, which our cells then can use, all right? All right, so let's talk about the organs, both prime, what's called primary digestive organs, that's the, everything in the tube, and then accessory organs. The oral cavity is where our digestive process begins. As you know, you go and you start eating and you chew your food up. Your teeth and your tongue are accessory organs because they're not part of the tube directly, but they lie around the tube. So the tube starts at your mouth but your teeth and your tongue are not part of that hollow tube. So when we chew our food up, not only are we mechanically breaking it down into smaller pieces, but we're also mixing the food items up with saliva, obviously produced by the three pairs of salivary glands that we're gonna learn. And so mixing the, the food up with saliva actually allows us to taste our food. Your taste buds can't taste anything that's dry. We can only taste when the molecules are dissolved in water, in, in that case in saliva, the water in saliva. So that's one thing. We taste our food when we, when we dissolve it in, in, the, in the saliva, but we also moisten it, moisten that whole little piece of food that we just chewed up. So you moisten your food, you mix it with some saliva, there are some enzymes in there 
that will begin chemical digestion in the mouth of certain molecules. And it produces, when you chew it up and mix it with saliva, it produces what we call a bolus. So that little ball of food that you now have chewed up, it's a little small piece and it's, it's kind of absorbed into some of the saliva so it's nice and moist, is called a bolus. And that's what we're gonna swallow. You're gonna swallow that, that bolus down the esophagus to your stomach. So before we get into that, let's look at what's in saliva. So on the physiology test, I want you to know what is produced where, and just know a little bit about them that's written out beside them. So immunoglobulin A, it's an antibody. It's secreted in saliva. So this, like other antibodies, are involved in protecting us against pathogens, microbes, right? So we're eating food and we probably are ingesting, you know, bacteria and other things constantly all the time. Of course we are. So immunoglobulin A, one of its roles is to prevent, say, the microbes that are in the food or that you are ingested. They don't adhere to the epithelial lining of the tube in your mouth or your esophagus or whatnot. It's not 100% effective but it does a pretty good job. So this helps prevent the binding of the bacteria uh, to the epithelium of the tube. We also have lysozyme in saliva. Now lysozyme is a bacteriolytic enzyme. And so this word bacteriolytic, that means that the bacteria are lysing open, they're bursting open. Lysozyme is also in your tears, is, a, is an enzyme that pokes holes in the wall of bacteria and it makes them pop open and die. So basically lysozyme kills bacteria. So it's all in your saliva. So the first two are protective molecules. The second two are actually enzymes. So the first enzyme that we see here is called salivary amylase. And whenever you see the word amylase, you need to think of an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates specifically starches. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But since this amylase is produced by the salivary glands and secreted into the oral cavity, we simply call it salivary amylase. So salivary amylase is an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates and a generic name for those types of enzymes is they're just called carbohydrates. So what does salivary amylase work on? Well, when you eat any starchy food, we begin the chemical digestion of starch and co other carbohydrates in the mouth. You actually start breaking them down chemically in your mouth. So I don't know if you remember too much. The last time you heard about polymers or things like polysaccharides and the other polymers like nucleic acids and proteins were probably in general biology. So I don't really have enough time to go back over all of the structures of those things. But as far as starch is concerned, what you should know is that it is a complex carbohydrate that is made of thousands and thousands of glucose molecules bonded together. Now, I know you know what glucose is. That's our blood sugar, right? So we get a lot of glucose when we eat starchy foods, rice, pasta, you know, breads, things like that. So you're getting a whole lot of glucose. Well, the glucose mo units are bonded together with a chemical bond that is broken by salivary amylase. So salivary amylase begins to break down that big, long, complex sugar, carbohydrate, into smaller pieces. It doesn't break them down into individual glucose molecules yet, but it's, it, it breaks them, the big, long molecule, down into manageable parts because there's gonna be other molecules that will still work on those smaller carbohydrates that were broken down from the bigger ones, right? So salivary amylase starts to break down starch and carbohydrates in the mouth. Then we have a lipase. Whenever you see the word lipase, that means an enzyme that breaks down lipids, basically fats. So this enzyme 
is involved in breaking fats down. So as we consume food items that have some fat in it, some lipids in it, we begin to break down some of those triglycerides in the mouth. Not a whole lot, but we do begin it. And so we call that particular enzyme lingual lipase, since it's made by the salivary glands and it's active in the mouth. So lingual lipase begins the breakdown of, of lipids in the mouth. Now those are the only two types of, of food molecules that we start chemical digestion in the mouth on. Proteins aren't chemically digested yet, none of, no nucleic acids, which is DNA and RNA, none of that. Just some carbohydrates begin to be broken down and some fats, some lipids. And it's because these are the enzymes that are doing that. Now, in saliva, we also have this buffer, bicarbonate. We're gonna talk about that several times before we finish the semester, bicarbonate. And so bicarbonate ions in saliva have the ability to absorb acid. And so when we eat foods or drink liquids, which are acidic, they can be buffered by the bicarbonate in our saliva. And so that's the role of bicarbonate really all over in our body. It buffers acids in various fluids and areas of our body. And we're gonna get into acid-base balance later but we do have that buffer in our saliva. Now your pharynx is the science name for your throat. There's actually three parts to your throat. The first part is in the upper portion at the back or posterior end of your nasal cavity. That's called the nasopharynx. If you open your mouth and look in the mirror at the back of your mouth, that's called the oropharynx. So what you think is the back of your mouth is called the oropharynx. And just below that, and at the tip of what we're gonna learn next week, your larynx, the tip of a piece of cartilage on our voice box, basically, that's called the laryngopharynx. So we have three parts to basically what we call our throat, and that then begins where the esophagus starts. So just at the junction of where the tip of our voice box is at, we call that tube the beginning, which runs behind your trachea, posterior to your trachea, is a collapsible muscular tube called the esophagus. So you guys know already that when we swallow food from our mouth, it goes to your stomach. You guys know that. And you probably already know the tube that it goes through is called the esophagus. So there's just a couple things here that we need to learn dealing with what we call swallowing. The science name for swallowing is called deglutition. Now, there are basically three different phases of deglutition. I'm not putting those three phases on this test. We're gonna, you're gonna do that in your, in your lecture. But ultimately there's a voluntary phase and there are two involuntary phases. So for instance, you voluntarily push your food items, which is called a bolus, to the back of your throat, at which point you choose to swallow. However, at a certain point, when your bolus gets, when your bolus gets a little bit lower, it turns into an involuntary reflex, in which case your food or whatever you swallow is going to your stomach, right? So there are three phases to it, but I want you to know deglutition is involved or is the act of swallowing. How does the food item, the bolus, get to the stomach? Well, I just called this a collapsible muscular tube. And that muscle tissue starts to contract and we call that muscle contraction peristalsis. These are wave-like contractions that force the food item, the bolus, down the esophagus. And the contraction is so strong that you can stand on your head and take a sip of water and swallow it and it would go away from gravity to your stomach. So that's how strong those contractions are. It's gonna to go to your stomach. Now, when the bolus reaches the junction of the esophagus where the esophagus meets the stomach, 
there's a special little circular muscle there that when it's contracted, it closes off the opening to the stomach. But when it relaxes, it opens up the esophagus to the stomach. So when the bolus reaches that distal portion of the esophagus, we have what is called the lower gastroesophageal sphincter relaxing. And that lower esophageal sphincter, when it relaxes, allows the bolus of food to get into your stomach. Now, when you finish swallowing your food, this same exact muscle has to contract in order to prevent the contents that we just swallowed from leaving the stomach and re-entering the esophagus. Now, some people have a problem with that sphincter muscle and it automatically opens a little bit sometimes. And that's called gastroesophageal reflux. So you know GERD? I'm sure you heard of that. Anyway, so you know people can regurgitate a little bit of stomach acid. It burns the bottom part of the esophagus, and we typically call that heartburn. But in a, in a chronic setting where it happens over and over and over, that's basically GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. So that's a problem with the sphincter muscle. So it has to open to allow you to, for food to enter the stomach. It has to contract to prevent food or the bolus at that point from leaving the stomach and you regurgitating it back up into the esophagus. That's the role of that sphincter muscle. Now, what about the stomach? Let's see what's in the stomach. Everybody knows there's acid in the stomach. You guys know that already. Um, the acid that is in the stomach is hydrochloric acid right here. HCl, hydrochloric acid. There's water in the stomach and then there's acid. So we have cells that line little bitty glands in what we call gastric pits in the stomach. And those cells produce all of these substances that become what we call gastric juice. So all of the, the fluid with all of the substances in the stomach being produced by the glands of the stomach is called gastric juice generically right? So that hydrochloric acid is involved in a couple of things. Number one, hydrochloric acid helps activate an enzyme that is produced by the, the gastric glands. And the enzyme is produced by the gastric gland in an inactive form. It's called pepsinogen. So whenever you see OGEN on the end of a word like this, that means that the enzyme is not activated yet. So pepsinogen is secreted to the lumen of the stomach, that's the open part of the stomach, but it can't do its job until it's activated. It's activated by hydrochloric acid. So when it hits that acidic environment, it becomes activated into what we call pepsin. So pepsin, is the activated form of pepsinogen. <clears throat> now, pepsin is an enzyme that's involved in breaking down protein. So any enzyme that starts to break down proteins into smaller pieces, and remember all proteins are made of amino acids. You might be breaking the protein down into little strings of amino acids that are four or five long, some are two, some are three long. So if you have a little piece of a protein that is made of three amino acids bonded together, that's called a tripeptide. If you have two of them bonded together, it's called a dipeptide. So ultimately we take big long proteins and we break them down into smaller sections and enzymes that do that are generically called proteases. So pepsin is a protease. So we're going to actually physically begin the chemical breakdown of protein in the stomach by pepsin, the action of pepsin. So hydrochloric acid activates pepsinogen in the pepsin. <coughs> but it also, hydrochloric acid also 
causes proteins and other large complex molecules to unfold. And what I mean to say by that is this. Well, let's just consider the protein since we're talking about that. Big, long proteins that you consume in foods that you eat, they're not just a simple string of amino acids. They actually have a shape, and they're all wound up on each other, and they're folded up. And so ultimately, all of those peptide bonds, the chemical bonds that we're trying to break, they're hidden. They might be in a little ball, you know, all wound up on itself. So before the enzyme can actually do its job and break down the chemical bonds, we have to unfold the protein. So when a complex molecule loses its three-dimensional shape and we're unfolding it, basically making it a linear piece of string, so to speak, that's called denaturation. So hydrochloric acid helps denature proteins, which exposes all of the peptide bonds to pepsin to allow pepsin to break them. Like a little pair of scissors, cutting a string in half, we have to expose that bond. Pepsin is like the scissors. So we have to expose all those bonds and hydrochloric acid does that by denaturing the proteins. Now we also have another enzyme produced by the gastric glands, it's another lipase, it's called gastric lipase. Again, lipases are enzymes that break down fats. So we had lingual lipase that started the breakdown of fats in the mouth as we're mixing our food up with saliva. But we also have a gastric lipase that continues to break down some fats and triglycerides in the stomach. Collectively together though, the action of lingual lipase and gastric lipase only accounts for about 30% or so of the digestion of the, the chemical digestion of fats. The majority of all fat digestion does occur in your small intestine. And I'm going to tell you what, how that works in a minute, but we do begin the breakdown of fats in the mouth and then continue to break down chemically fats in the stomach. Now we also have intrinsic factor. You may or may not have ever heard of that, but intrinsic factor is a molecule that is required for our body to absorb vitamin B12 in the ileum. So in your intestine. So as we get older, we produce less intrinsic factor. And as we produce less intrinsic factor, we, we absorb less vitamin B12. Well, one of the roles, one of the many roles, I should say, of vitamin B12 is the production of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, as you know, is found in red blood cells. We already know that. It carries oxygen for us. So some elderly people have to go to the doctor and get a B12 shot. I'm sure you heard of that before. They might get some intrinsic factor, but you definitely give them a B12 because they might be a little anemic. Why are they anemic? Ultimately the root cause, at least if it's this type of anemia, is they don't have enough intrinsic factor to absorb their vitamin B12, which is required for hemoglobin production. So nonetheless, this factor is produced by the stomach and allows us to absorb our B12 vitamin. All right, so let's talk about the liver and the pancreas. The liver is actually, a, believe it or not, a big chemistry set in our body. It's involved with many different systems, including the blood for that matter, um, because it produces a lot of plasma proteins. But in this case, it's obviously important for the digestive system or we wouldn't be talking about it. So one of its roles, its many roles, is to produce a substance called bile. Now bile is an excretory product, obviously produced by the liver, that is composed of many things. There's some things called bile salts. There's some cholesterol, bicarbonate ions, which again are buffers. Uh, the breakdown component of hemoglobin a part of that is called bilirubin, and there's many different types of electrolytes or ions in there. And this is just a few of the things, and water, obviously, because it's a liquid. Well, this excretory product, bile, is produced by the liver, and it's carried to the first part of the small intestine, called the duodenum, 
by the biliary duct system. So there's several different ducts. I'm going to show you some of them on the models after I'm done talking about the physiology part here. But you probably heard of the common bile duct. So that's a part of the duct system that we're going to look at and learn. And it transports bile to the small intestine where bile is going to be active. So what is the importance of bile? Well, obviously it's an excretory product. So we can get rid of some waste products because it's going to go to the intestine. And obviously if we're putting things in the intestine and we don't absorb it, guess where it's going to end up? Out of your body and feces when you go to the bathroom. So it is an excretory product. But as far as digestion is concerned, it's important for the, the digestion of fats. So here's the thing though, bile is not an enzyme. It does not chemically break down fat, but what it does do is it emulsifies fats. So I have to tell you what that means. Everybody knows that oil and water does not mix already. If you have a glass of water, you put some oil in there, it's gonna float on the top, right? So when you're eating fats in your diet, what do, you, what do you think it looks like when it's in your body? It's little bitty oil droplets. They don't mix in the water, it's little bitty droplets. So the problem with that is all of these enzymes that we are learning about are proteins, by the way, and they're all water soluble. So a water soluble enzyme has a very tough time trying to get at the chemical bonds of a hydrophobic molecule like a, a fats that are balled up together in a little oil droplet. So to make the chemical digestion of fats a little easier, what we do is we take that oil droplet and we break it down into millions of tiny little bitty oil droplets which basically increases the surface area of all of the fats that we just consumed so that the, the water soluble enzymes can then act all at one time on all those little droplets and break down the fat molecules. So basically the lipases can only work from the outside of the oil droplet inward. So, you know, it, it's a lot easier to crush a Coke can at one time than it is to try and you know tear down a house. The house is much bigger. It's gonna take a lot longer. You can crush the Coke can fairly simply. So that analogy is sort of like the oil droplet. If you have a huge oil droplet and you don't break it down physically into smaller droplets, it's gonna take forever to digest it. But if you take that oil droplet and you break it down into millions of small ones, that's called emulsification and it gives more surface area for the enzymes to work on to chemically break the bonds of the fats. So that's, the, that's what bile is involved with, emulsifying the fat. Now the pancreas is an, a gland that is going to produce a multitude of enzymes and a buffer, there's still bicarbonate in there, but a multitude of enzymes that are all active in the small intestine. So your pancreas actually lies just posterior and slightly inferior to your stomach. It has a duct that connects to the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum. And so the pancreas produces all of these substances, these enzymes and bicarbonate, and secretes them into the duodenum via the, what's called the pancreatic duct. So let's, let me tell you what these all are. Bicarbonate is a buffer just like I said before. It's important here because all of the food items, oh, which I forgot to tell you, in the stomach when we mix up our food with the gastric juice, your food becomes liquefied. So all those little boli that we were swallowing, the little pieces of food, they become completely liquefied in your stomach. And that liquefied food is called chyme. I forgot to tell you that word, chyme. So this chyme, which is now going to leave the stomach and enter your small intestine, is acidic. Remember, there's a whole bunch of acid in the stomach, right? And now it's all mixed up with this liquefied food we call chyme. The problem there is that all of these enzymes that are produced by the pancreas, 
do not work very well at all in acidic environments. So we actually have to take this acidic chyme and raise the pH up. And that's what bicarbonate is going to do. So as the pH starts to come up, these enzymes can start to be activated. So here's the order in which they're activated. Trypsinogen, see ogen on the end, means it's inactive. When it hits the small intestine, the duodenum, there is an enzyme in there called enterokinase. Enterokinase activates trypsinogen into the active form called trypsin. Whoops, called trypsin, right there. Now, trypsin breaks down protein. So it's a protease. So trypsin has to be activated first because these other ones are activated by trypsin. So trypsinogen is activated to trypsin by enterokinase. We then have chymotrypsinogen, another enzyme inactive, in, in an inactive form, that is activated by trypsin into chymotrypsin. And chymotrypsin is a protease again. We then have procarboxypeptidase, which is an inactivated enzyme as well. But notice it doesn't have ogen on the end, but we have the prefix pro. So another way we can designate if an enzyme is not activated yet, besides putting ogen on the end, is putting pro in the name. So procarboxypeptidase is activated by trypsin to carboxypeptidase. You see the activated form, we just change the name a little bit. So it's no big deal. So trypsin is activating these enzymes. Another protease, proelastase, with pro on the front, is activated by trypsin into elastase. We then have uh, enzymes that break down carbohydrates. Another amylase produced by the pancreas. So this one's going to be called pancreatic amylase. Pancreatic amylase continues to act on starches that have not been broken down chemically yet or smaller parts of starches that have been broken down to smaller strings of sugars, but they're still rather large. So the pancreatic amylase is still acting on the carbohydrates, so breaking down the bonds of, of carbohydrates in the small intestine. All of these enzymes from the pancreas are working in the small intestine, by the way. We also have a lipase in the that's secreted by the pancreas is called pancreatic lipase. So what does that enzyme do? Well, it continues to break down fats in your small intestine. Now, together, pancreatic lipase, along with the help of bile, although bile is not chemically breaking down the fat, bile aids in the chemical breakdown of fats in the small intestine by pancreatic lipase. So, Pancreatic lipase does not do its job very well at all if we don't have bile or if we don't have enough of it. So the majority of all the fats that we're consuming in our diet is broken down by pancreatic lipase in the small intestine. About 30% of all the lipids are broken down by lingual and gastric lipase. The rest of them are broken down in the small intestine by pancreatic lipase. Um, now we have... Question. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, did you just say that um, the bile helps uh, with the, the pancreatic juices to do a uh, job? If you don't have bile, it does, the juices don't work well. That's what you said? Yes. If you don't have bile, you aren't going to be feeling very well if you eat a lot of fat, a fatty diet. Because when we cannot digest fat effectively, we get very, very upset stomachs. So severe in some cases, people have to be hospitalized. So people that have, say, their gallbladder out, um, which we don't know what the gallbladder is exactly yet, but the gallbladder is a temporary storage site for bile. So as it turns out, our cells in our intestine, which I'm going to go over this hormone in a minute, but our cells in our intestine know if we eat a meal that's rich in fat and protein. Right. And if we eat a meal that's rich in fat and protein, then that just means we need more bile secretion. So the gallbladder is signified by a hormone to contract and it squishes more bile down to the small intestine. So our pancreatic lipase can then effectively break down the, 
however much fat that we just consumed. So if we don't have bile, the pancreatic lipase cannot break down the lipids effectively enough before the fats are passing out of the small intestine. So we don't, we don't completely break down all of those fat, the oil droplets into their individual lipid components. You might not know what the lipids are made of. They're made of fatty acids and a molecule called glycerol. So all of those components have to be broken down chemically. So ultimately, if we don't have bile, we have severe diarrhea, cramping, you know, all of that stuff. So people that have their gallbladder removed have to watch how much fat that they eat at one time because they're the only the only amount of bile that they'll have is the amount that the liver is actively secreting. So basically the, the gallbladder is a storage site. If you remove it, you still get bile, but you don't, you can't control how much you get because you don't have that, that extra, like a gas tank. You don't have a, the, the ga extra gas tank. So the liver constantly has bile dripping down to the small intestine. But if you eat too much fat, that amount of bile drip from the liver to the small intestine might not be enough for you to digest your fats effectively. And that's why people get sick if they eat too much fatty foods and they don't have a gallbladder. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right, so we have two other enzymes we need to know from, that's in, oh, also all of these components in, in, in the pancreas is called pancreatic juice, just like we had the gastric juice. So in pancreatic juice, we have two enzymes that break down DNA and RNA. I know you remember those names. Uh, the, the enzyme that starts to break down RNA is called a ribonuclease generically. And the one for DNA is called deoxyribonuclease. And so a nuclease is a generic name for an enzyme that breaks down nucleic acids. And the two nucleic acids that we're concerned with are deoxyribonucleic acid, which is DNA, and ribonucleic acid, which is RNA. All right, so let's talk about the small intestine and some of the enzymes that are actually made there and what those enzymes do. So the small intestine is where we finalize the chemical digestion of all of our food items, by the way. It's also the, the part of the digestive system where we have the most nutrients absorbed into the blood and also in the lymphatic system. We absorb fats into the lymphatic system first and all the other nutrients go into the blood or cardiovascular system. So we're gonna absorb, finalize the chemical digestion of all of our nutrients and we're gonna absorb them through the small intestine lining into the blood and or lymphatic system. So let's look at what the intestinal gland cells produce, right? So um, and, the, and the lining of the small intestine, which is, as you learned in AMP1, a non-ciliated, simple columnar epithelium. Non-ciliated, simple columnar epithelium. At the very surface of those columnar cells are an invagination of its apical membrane over and over and over and over. And it forms these tiny, tiny, tiny little finger-like projections called microvilli. And the microvilli is what we call the brush border. So the brush border is the very top of the columnar cell. There's some mucus up there and there's some enzymes at the surface of those cells. So as your food items are passing over the surface of this epithelium, we have these enzymes that finalize the breakdown of all our nutrients. So let's talk about them. Alpha dextrinase is an enzyme that breaks down pieces of sugars called dextrins. I'm not going to get into their breakdown components of starches. So alpha dextrinase is a carbohydrate. It's going to finalize the breakdown basically of some components from starch. We also have some enzymes that break down some carbohydrates, which are called disaccharides. I don't know if you remember that term. But a disaccharide is a carbohydrate that's made of two monomers, two sugar monomers bonded together. So the main disaccharides are maltose, sucrose, and lactose. You might have heard of lactose. I don't know if you heard of maltose. Sucrose is table sugar. I know you heard of that. 
So the enzyme that breaks down maltose disaccharide is called maltase. So all we do is change that A and O. So the sugar has an O in the name, maltose, and the enzyme that breaks it down is called maltase, right? Sucrose, which is table sugar, is broken down by sucrase. And then milk sugar, lactose, is broken down by lactase. So all of those are carbohydrates, generic to them. So we have to break all of the sugars down into individual sugar monomers before we can absorb them. And that's what these enzymes do for us. They break the sugars down into individual subunits. Now, we have a couple of proteases that finalize the breakdown of amino acids. So we have what's called an amino peptidase and a dipeptidase. So amino peptidases break down amino acids and dipeptidases actually split dipeptides apart. A dipeptide is basically two amino acids that are bonded together. That's all. And so a dipeptidase breaks that peptide bond to release the individual amino acids. And then we have the amino peptidases that can break down some of those amino acids into smaller components, which we don't have to get into that chemistry right now. And then we finalize the breakdown of nucleic acids, specifically the subunits that make up nucleic acids called nucleotides. We break them down with these enzymes. So nucleotides are the building block of DNA and RNA. When we have the nucleotide, we have to break them down. There's three parts that make them up. A sugar, either ribose or deoxyribose, a base, which you learned of as the letters of DNA, ATCG, if you remember that, in RNA, it's AUCG, but the base and then a phosphate group is attached to it. So those nucleotides are broken down by nucleosidase and then phosphatases. They finalize the breakdown of nucleotides. So we can absorb those components into the blood. So all of these are what we call our brush border enzymes. And they hang out at the top of that simple columnar epithelium and as the food passes over the top of it, these enzymes are breaking those bonds, allowing those bro broken down nutrient components to be absorbed into the blood. All right, so let's talk about the large intestine, and then we're gonna get into uh, the hormones that I was mentioning earlier that I wanted to tell you about. So the large intestine actually has several parts to it, and we're gonna look at it on a model. There's something called the ascending colon, that goes up your right lateral side of your body, your abdomen, your abdominal cavity. It then courses over the front of your abdomen. That's called the transverse colon. It then goes down your left lateral side. That's called the descending colon. And then it has a little turn to it called the sigmoid colon. We're gonna learn how to identify that. Our cells in our colon, the mucosal lining, that colum those columnar cells in the, in the mucosal lining of the colon do not make any enzymes for us. So we don't make any of our own enzymes in the colon, which means we don't perform any chemical digestion in the colon whatsoever. However, we have a lot of bacteria that inhabit our gut. There's more bacteria that live in your gut and on your body than you have your own cells that make up your body, by the way. And those good bacteria that are in our gut in your large intestine can produce some enzymes that can help break down certain types of molecules that we didn't break down as of yet chemically. Those bacteria also are involved in the production of certain vitamins. There's some B vitamins and vitamin K. In fact, about 50% of your vitamin K is absorbed in your large intestine, which is produced by bacteria. All right, so you're gonna learn a lot more about this kind of stuff in your nutrition class if you haven't taken it yet. And if you already did, then I'm sure you learned a little bit about that. So your large intestine is going to be involved with extracting as much water and as many electrolytes out of your food items that are passing from the small intestine into the large intestine. As the food item moves through your large intestine, we extract a maximal amount of water out of it. So by the time that food 
that and material that we have not broken down chemically and or absorbed yet is a solid mass called feces by the time it gets to the end and then we go to the bathroom and eliminate it right so we do absorb water and electrolytes and some vitamins through the lining of our large intestine in fact in your large intestine is where you absorb the majority of the water from the food items that have been passing through the intestine the whole time right um, and then we have the rectum and then the anus. The rectum is the distal end at, after the large intestine is a temporary storage site for feces, fecal matter, until we go to the bathroom. Now, as far as the regulation of the digestive system is concerned, if you remember from AMP1 about the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system is the system that controls and activates digestion. The sympathetic system turns the digestive system off. So that's why it's never a good thing to go eat a big meal and then go run a marathon right away because you're not gonna digest your food effectively. So, and it's also one reason why you get kind of tired after you eat because you get full your parasympathetic system starts to fire on all cylinders and the parasympathetic nervous system is the part of the system that makes you rest and digest and conserve energy. So we have a portion of that that's activated within the lining of the organs of our gastrointestinal tract. And that part of the nervous system is called the enteric nervous system and there's a plexus of nervous tissue in the lining that I'm going to show you on the model. It's called the myenteric plexus. We also have a submucosal plexus. All of these nervous tissue areas are involved in initiating the reflexes of digestion. Now, there are three basic phases of digestion. I'm not going to make you go through all the details of those phases, but I just want to mention them here. We have what's called the cephalic phase. The cephalic phase is the phase where you're thinking about food and you're hungry or you're smelling food and you go, oh, I can't wait to eat and your mouth starts to water. That's called the cephalic phase because it's in your head, everything around your head. Now, when you begin to consume your food and chew your food up, even before you swallow the food and then just as you're swallowing and the food is entering the stomach, your stomach is activated. You move into what's called the gastric phase of digestion. The gastric phase of digestion involves the activation of smooth muscle in the stomach, which turns your food up, the chyme, with all the gastric juice. The gastric juice is gonna be produced and secreted. So we have what's called gastric motility. That's when your muscles contracting, mixing everything up and you have gastric secretion. That's where we're producing the acid, hydrochloric acid, and the pepsinogen, and all of the stuff that we just talked about, gastric lipase, right? So all of that's being made, and then we are, you know, move the food as we mix it up with the gastric uh, juice into the small intestine. That's called gastric emptying. Once that happens, you go into the third phase of digestion, which is called the intestinal phase. All of those phases are regulated by the parasympathetic nervous system and certain hormones that will be released. So ultimately, we know when we are full, if you eat a lot and you say, oh man, I ate too much, I'm really full. We know that because when our stomach is filled with food, it stretches. And so we have what's called a stretch receptor reflex. And when our stomach is stretched, it signals the brain to say, hey, I'm not hungry anymore, and you stop eating. On the other hand, though, if your stomach is empty and it's not stretched, then we have the opposite effect. Your brain fires parasympathetic reflexes, and you get hungry, and you want to eat. So it's a simple stretch receptor reflex, which is going to help, not the only way, but help control our eating patterns, whether you're full or you're hungry. So 
The other thing that happens is this, when you consume your food and you swallow the boli down to your stomach, yes, there's hydrochloric acid in your stomach, but as the food is entering the stomach and is being mixed with the acid and other items, uh, substances and gastric juice, the pH of the stomach starts to come up. It rises because the food is absorbing the acid. So there's a negative reflex that says, hey, wait a minute, the pH of the stomach just came up a little bit too much. We better produce more acid. And so what happens? Your gastric glands produce more hydrochloric acid and secretes it to the stomach. That's all part of the gastric phase or reflex of the gastric phase of digestion. So what about the enzyme? I mean, uh, the hormones? Let's talk about these three, gastrin, cholecystokinin, and secre uh, secretin. Gastrin is an enzyme that is made by the gastric glands in the stomach itself. And it really is going to be involved in a couple of things. One, it is released by the gastric glands in the stomach as the pH of the stomach starts to increase. That means the pH gets higher. When the pH gets higher, that's a signal that food items have entered the stomach and have absorbed some of the acid which means we need to make more acid. So gastrin is involved in stimulating the secretion of more gastric juice. It also is the enzyme that helps activate the smooth muscle contraction around the lining of the stomach to increase what we call gastric motility. That's gonna help churn your food up and mix it with all of the gastric juice and then totally liquefy it in order to turn it into what we call chyme. Cholecystokinin and secretin are actually produced by cells in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. Those special type of endocrine gland cells are called enteroendocrine cells. This entero means that we're in the intestine. So enteroendocrine cells are the cells in the gastric glands that produce some hormones for us that's gonna help regulate aspects of digestion. So here's how this works. As the stomach is emptying food, or I should say chyme, emptying chyme into the small intestine, the duodenum, the cells in the duodenum, interestingly enough, have the ability to determine what type of molecules you just ate. That's kind of crazy. Our intestinal cells know if you just ate a birthday cake or if you just ate a steak. It's kind of crazy. So when we are eating meals that are rich in proteins and fats, those enteroendocrine cells produce cholecystokinin and release it. So cholecystokinin gets in the blood, it migrates to one of its targets, which is the gallbladder, and it causes the muscle, smooth muscle around the gallbladder to contract. And the gallbladder being a temporary storage site of bile, when it contracts, it squeezes out and ejects more bile down to the duodenum. That's a good thing, isn't it? Because we just ate a whole bunch of protein and fat. And in order to effectively digest lipids chemically, we have to have bile to allow pancreatic lipase to chemically break down the lipids. So the more fat you eat, the more bile we need and cholecystokinin helps in increasing that bile ejection down to the small intestine. The other thing is this, when you eat a meal that's rich in fat and that chyme starts to enter the duodenum and we produce cholecystokinin, yep, it's gonna cause the gallbladder to eject more bile to the duodenum so we can more effectively start digesting our fat. Again, the problem is, is that the enzymes are water soluble. Pancreatic lipase is water soluble. It does take a little bit of time to break away the bonds of that little bitty oil droplet. So it takes longer for your system to digest fats than it does sugar. Sugar just, and just simple carbohydrates just run through very quickly. So since it takes a long time, to digest the lipids in the small intestine, cholecystokinin also inhibits gastric emptying. 
which means it takes longer for your stomach to empty all of its contents into the small intestine if it's loaded down with fats. And that's why if you eat a meal that's rich in protein and fat, you feel like you stay full longer than if you ate a piece of birthday cake. All of that sugar runs through your stomach within 30 minutes. Whereas a meal that's rich in protein and a lot of fat in it can stay in your stomach to up to an hour or more. Because the kind that's in your stomach is not emptied all at one time into the duodenum. It actually squirts in there. As the stomach contracts, there's another sphincter muscle that rhythmically opens and closes and allows little bitty squirts of that chyme from the stomach to enter the duodenum. So it takes longer for that emptying process to occur if there's a lot of fats in your diet, in your stomach, than it does if you just ate something with simple sugars in it. So you get hungry quicker if you just eat a candy bar. You know, you feel okay right away because you just got a sugar rush. Then you kind of come down and then you're hungry again in a little while. So at any rate, that's what cholecystokinin is doing. It releases more bile from the, the gallbladder and it slows down gastric emptying. Now we also have secretin. Secretin is produced by the enteroendocrine cells in a duodenum and it happens in response to a drop in the pH of the duodenum. Remember what I said when we have gastric emptying, that chyme is acidic, right? So we have a drop in that pH, it's becoming uh, acidic in the duodenum. So to counterbalance all of that acid, secretin causes the pancreas and the liver to produce their products, bile from the liver, and pancreatic juice from the pancreas to produce their products to contain more bicarbonate than normal. So initially, ultimately, bile and pancreatic juice is gonna be dumping in a lot of bicarbonate in order to take and raise the pH back up to normal. Secretin also is going to inhibit the stomach from producing any more acid. So it basically blocks the secretion phase of the secretion in a gastric phase of digestion. So it blocks the secretion of gastric juice. We don't need any more of it. We have too much acid already entering. So there's a very fine coordination between the duodenum and the stomach when it comes to motility and the secretion of enzymes and acids. All right. All right. So that's about it for the physiology. Um, the next part of this chapter goes through all of the structures of the digestive system, right? So I'm going to pull up the, where do I have it at? I need to go back here and find it. I need to pull up the models book to show you guys some of these models. All right. Oh, also, you need to make sure you're, you're reviewing the cat dissection videos. There are a few questions on a cat dissection. I don't have any pictures of them. So if you want more, you can either Google it yourself or you can, you can email me. I can find something uh, to send you, but there's only a couple of questions on it, but you still need to review the, the, the video. I forget which professor made this. I haven't been back to class on campus, you know, since we left. So I was not able to, to go and film a cat dissection on my own. So make sure you review that. All right. Um, I did upload this appendix with the figure exercise answers uh, for the models book stuff. I know we already had it somewhere along the way, but I also added it here. All right. So let me pull up the models book chapter. So we can run down through some of these models, all right? All right, so it's not my goal to go over every single structure on all of these models. Um, 
because I do have all the answers for you on these pictures in that little appendix, but I do want to go over a couple of them on each, you know, each part. And then when you're at home studying, because you're going to have a couple of weeks, I forgot we, we had all that time off in between when you're studying, if you have a problem with one of the models, just email me or take a screenshot of something like if it's in one of the assignments or whatever, and I'll help you out with that. All right. So if you look at this picture I have at the very front of the chapter that I made, this is actually a model that, which is of the whole digestive system. So what I did is I, when I took the pictures of everything on this model, I cut the head off with a part of the esophagus so to make this one picture. So this head part right here actually is on this model. So it was really all just one model but I couldn't fit it very well all on one page. So I, I cut it and made it into different parts. So this is the head model. I'm just gonna go over a couple of these things. Some of these things have nothing to do with the digestive system, but I put some pointers on them anyway. Um, for instance, like the frontal sinus and the frontal bone you learned about in AMP1, the sphenoid sinus and the sphenoid bone right here. Here's the pituitary gland we covered in the endocrine system. You know, So obviously that's not part of the digestive system. But I put pointers on these things because they're all on the models anyway. So um, these are the turbinate bones or the conchal bones you learned in AMP1 and the nasal cavity. This is the nasal cavity. Um, this is the upper jaw bone, the maxilla, if you remember that, and your palate, your hard palate. This is the lower jaw bone, the mandible. These are your upper and lower teeth. I think I just put teeth somewhere in here. Uh, five, these are the lips. So you see it's a mid-sagittal section. It's a sagittal section of the head. Um, this is the tongue in the oral cavity. This is the oral cavity. And then we have some structures that you need to be able to identify in here. Even though they're still not part directly of uh, the digestive system, um, they are very important and you know what they are once I tell you the names. Some tonsils. So we have some a uh, pair of tonsils at the base of our tongue. These are called the lingual tonsils right here. So this is the base of our tongue. Um, we have a pair of tonsils that you, if you still have yours, you can see at the back of your throat. Some people have theirs taken or removed. That would be what this number 17 is pointing to. That's, those are called the palatine tonsils. Um, this little structure where 18 is pointing is that little soft tissue doolally thing that hangs in the back of your throat. Kind of funny to say it that way, huh? Yeah, so that's called the uvula. So when we swallow food, our tongue forces that bolus to the back of our throat, by the back of the oral pharynx. And when that happens, your tongue forces this soft tissue, the uvula up, and it closes off this opening right here. So if, if we didn't have that happen, food and water would go up through the back end of your nasal cavity. So when you swallow, this uvula gets pushed upward and prevents food and drink from regurgitating up into the what's called the nasopharynx. So that's the lingual tonsil, that's the palatine, this is the uvula, and this is the pharyngeal tonsil, which is at the superior posterior portion of the nasopharynx. So this is the nasopharynx up here, this is the oropharynx at the back of your throat, and then from here down to the beginning of the esophagus is what we call the laryngopharynx. I don't have all that labeled, but I just wanted to show you what that was. All right. And they have some other things on here labeled, mainly of the voice box and whatnot. We're going to do some of that next week. So I'm just going to skip over that for now. We do all this respiratory stuff next week. Um, this is the esophagus, the hollow muscular tube right here. We also have this model. This is a, a small model that, well, it looks big here because I, I took an up close picture, but Nonetheless, it's a model showing the salivary glands. We have three pairs of salivary glands around the oral cavity. The largest of those three pairs lie just anterior to your ear, right? Right on basically the, right above your mandible jawline, the, the, the angle of your mandible by the, what was called the ramus, if y'all remember that on the mandible. So right above your jaw, if you feel the lower part of your jaw below your ear and then palpitate up along in front of your ear, you're palpitating the, the parotid gland. So these are the parotids. And so the duct that leads from the parotid gland to secrete saliva from it to the oral cavity 
which is colored green on this model, is called the parotid duct. This is the tongue. It's reflected up a little bit so we can see the underside of it. And there's a pair of salivary glands that lie under the tongue. And the glands that lie under the tongue are called sublingual glands, the sublinguals. Sublingual just means below tongue. So the little bitty green, you can barely see them on this picture, but the little bitty green lines that you see right there, those would be the sublingual ducts to secrete the saliva from the sublingual glands into your oral cavity. Um, we then have a gland that lies below the mandible. So I don't know if you could tell, but in this little model, the mandible, mandible has been cut. So it's been cut here and there. So the, the body and the, and the ramus there has been removed. So below this bone, just under your jaw and on the end, going more immediately to it, is the submandibular gland. So we have a pair of those. So parotid, sublingual, submandibular. Submandibular means below mandible. So that little bitty duct right there is a submandibular duct. All right, so those all are producing saliva for us that contains all those substances we just went over. Now here is the rest of that, what I used to call the digestive board model, because it's all on a big board in lab. If we could be there physically to look at it, you would know what I was saying. But nonetheless, this is the rest of the digestive system. So just to go over some of the structures here, um, the esophagus up here, that's where we're swallowing food through. Then obviously we have the stomach. There's different parts to the stomach. So the very first part of the stomach that's in the upper left-hand quadrant up here is where number 19 is pointing. This upper bulge on the left side is called the fundus. The fundus of the stomach. It's always called the fundus. And then we have a body, the body of the stomach. That's what 18 is pointing to. And sometimes people just put stomach you know, or used to when I put a sticker on that. But nonetheless, uh, that's the broad part is called the body. Now, you notice the stomach makes like this little J shape. From this little crease of the J onward is actually all part of what we call the pylorus. I'm gonna show you that on a picture in a minute. And there's, there's a couple of parts to the pylorus. So the stomach then leads into the first part of the small intestine, which this is. So number five is pointing to the duodenum that we just talked about. Number six, that little green tube, that's what we call the common bile duct. So bile is gonna be made by the lobes of the liver. It can be stored in the gallbladder and it's secreted through what's called the biliary system through all these little green tubes. We're gonna see it better in a minute. But the tube down here is called the common bile duct. So bile is gonna enter the small intestine there. The pancreas, which this is right here, is lies just inferior and a little posterior to the stomach, right? Um, it is the part that we're interested in are the acini cells that produce those pancreatic enzymes. And all of them are secreted to the duodenum via this little white tube right here. So that little white tube in the middle is just called the pancreatic duct. And the main pancreatic duct, which this is pointing to, joins with the common bile duct right here. So pancreatic juice and bile enters the small intestine at the same spot right there, which we'll see a little bit more in a little while. Now there are lobes of the liver, at least on this low magnification picture of this model. The, this lobe over here more medially, this the more medially, more lateral on this side of your body, the more medial lobe, which is a little bit smaller, then the other one is a left lobe of the liver. The left lobe of the liver, which is separated from the right lobe of the liver by a ligament called the falciform ligament. That's what that is. And then this large lobe over here where the gallbladder lies just underneath it, that whole section is called the right lobe of the liver. Now we have two other little lobes that we're gonna identify when we look at the liver model in a second. But those are the two main lobes, the left one and the right one, right? The gallbladder is a temporary storage site for bile. And then we have the biliary system, the duct system. And I'm gonna show you what those ducts look like in a second. So down here, we have really three parts to the small intestine. 
I don't have all three parts labeled, but I'm going to point to them just in case uh, they ask you that on the practical. So obviously the, the small, the shortest section is the duodenum right here, right? So the first part of the small intestine is duodenum. And then it courses behind all of this. So it's, that tube is running behind all of this and it forms all of this. So this next part of the small intestine, technically where number 15 is located, in the list down here somewhere, I just put small intestine. Technically, that part of the small intestine up here is called the jejunum. The jejunum. So we have the duodenum, the jejunum, and then the last part as we come down here, all of that, which is all down here, is called the ileum. So if there's a pointer down here and it's asking you what specific part that is, that's the ileum. If there's a pointer up here, that's the jejunum. And if there's a pointer obviously over here, that's the duodenum. Now the reason why I'm telling you that is because there is a little valve right here that you're gonna have to be able to identify. The junction between the small intestine, specifically the last part of it called the ileum, and the large intestine at an area called the cecum, which I don't have a pointer on. That valve is called the ilio cecal valve. So it opens and closes as the liquefied food is leaving the ileum, enters the cecum into the small, into the large intestine, the colon. Now this is all the right, lower right quadrant of your abdominal cavity over here, by the way. So the, hanging off of that cecum is your appendix. So your appendix is in the lower part of your right side of your abdomen. I think you guys might know that already. So that's your appendix down there. Now, as the food items are coming into the large intestine, they're gonna go up this way. So this section is called the ascending colon. So it's gonna go up the right lateral side of your body. It then will course across your abdomen, that's called the transverse colon, and then go down the left lateral side of your body, that's called the descending colon. Now notice, right here it makes a turn. It goes, it turns, and then it goes posterior, goes in, and then flips up and comes back out. So it makes like an S turn right there. This area where it makes that S turn is called the sigmoid colon. So we have ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid, colon. Then you have your rectum, temporary storage site for the feces till you go to the bathroom, and then the anus, which controls the opening there. Now, I did not put pointers on this, but you may have it on some of those activities in the lab, and they may have it on the practical. So I'm going to tell you what, it, what this is. We have two sphincter muscles around that controls the opening and closing of our anus. And so the muscle tissue that is closer to the wall itself is called the internal anal sphincter muscle. So if there's a pointer pointing at the muscle tissue right here, if y'all can see my pointer, right, right around there, you're gonna call it the internal anal sphincter. If the pointer is pointing out here to the edge, that's called the external anal sphincter. Same thing on this side, because these are circular muscles, by the way, they go around this way, like a donut. So there's an inner band right around the edge of the tube, and there's an outer band. The inner band is called the internal, the outer band is called the external anal sphincter muscles, right? All right, so that's, that. Now what I did is I also took an up close picture of the same model right here because I wanted to see some of the features in a little bit more detail. And I took the picture and I also removed this part of the stomach. On this model, this outer part of this model right here on the stomach can, can be removed. So now on this next picture, we're looking at the same model, but it's a lot, a lot more detail we can make out because I took an up close picture and I removed that top part of the stomach. <clears throat> All right, so I know it's not labeled, but this is the esophagus again. Where the esophagus joins to the stomach is a sphincter muscle, which is called the lower esophageal sphincter. That's what number 16 is pointing to. 
So remember that sphincter muscle has to open to allow food to enter the stomach, but it has to contract and close to prevent your stomach contents from being regurgitated back up. So that valve is going to open and close to regulate the entry and block the exiting back of food items from your stomach. Now, the top part up here of the stomach again, this area is always called the fundus. Inside the stomach is not smooth. We have these little ridges of tissue that number 14 is pointing to. Those are called rugae. So on the test, you have to put gastric rugae to signify it's in the stomach because we do have rugae in our urinary bladder. And obviously we're not talking about that yet. But nonetheless, these little bands of mucosal lining in here are called the gastric rugae. This whole area of the stomach past the little turn of the J is called the pylorus. Uh, we identify the specific areas a little bit more clearly on the stomach model in a minute. But we also have a sphincter muscle at this end of the stomach. So this is the end of the pylorus, which is the end of the stomach that connects to the duodenum, the small intestine. So we have a sphincter muscle that wraps around here as well. That's called the pyloric sphincter. So these two sphincter muscles, the lower esophageal sphincter and the pyloric sphincter have to be contracted and thus close off their openings when the stomach is churning up your food and doing its job. For instance, if the lower esophageal sphincter opens and your stomach mus uh, muscularis layer contracts, the muscle layer contracts, the food's going to be propelled up back up if that muscle relaxes. Also, when our stomach is trying to empty food into the chyme, into the duodenum, the pyloric sphincter rhythmically opens and closes, opens and closes, opens and closes, so we get chyme squirting basically into, rhythmically squirting into the duodenum because the entire stomach contents is not emptied all at one time. Some things are emptied quicker. If you just drink water and you eat sugar, it's gonna empty out very quickly. You eat protein and fat, it's gonna hang out in your stomach a little bit longer because of that cholecystokinin, right? Hormone that we talked about. All right, so this is all the duodenum. Now, I know on, on my pictures, I didn't put a pointer on these little bitty folds in the duodenum. Notice it's not flat in there either. They might make you want to know that. So I'm just going to tell you what they are and you can just review this or email me later. These little folds of ridges here are called plicae circularis. The plicae circularis. Now the liver, we see the left lobe here. It's more medially. It's a little bit smaller than the big lobe over here is the right lobe. On the underside of the right lobe is the gallbladder. Now, leading from the left lobe and from the right lobe would be one of these green ducts. So you would have a green duct from the left, you would have a green duct from the right. The green duct coming from the right lobe would be called the right hepatic duct. Just can't see it too well. The green duct that would come from the left lobe of the liver, which is a, just that tiny little piece is coming from the left lobe right there. That's called the left hepatic duct. Now, if you can envision that, you could see that duct because it goes inside the liver. You would have a, a, a piece here, and for the right side, you would have a piece there. It makes a Y shape. Now, where the left and right Hepatic ducts join together. Number four is pointing to that little bitty stretch of green tube. That's called the common hepatic duct. So we have a left hepatic, I mean a right hepatic from the right lobe. You have a left hepatic from the left lobe and where they join together forms a common hepatic. Now there is a duct that leads from the gallbladder. The duct that leads from the gallbladder, which number seven is pointing to, is called the cystic duct. So where the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct join together is also a little Y shape. You see that? 
So where these two ducts join together from that point down all the way to the duodenum is called the common bile duct. So you have right and left hepatics. You have a short stretch called common hepatic. You have a cystic duct from the gallbladder where the cystic duct and the common hepatic join forms the common bile duct. Not too bad, right? It's basically just two Y shapes. The right and left hepatic form a Y and the cystic and the common hepatic form a Y. And then from that point down is a common bile duct, right? Now, um, in the pancreas, we have the, the main duct. Notice we have a little split here. I'm going to show you that on the model in a minute. But the main duct is just called the pancreatic duct, right? So let's move on to the stomach. Now, they may have a slightly different model of the stomach. Um, this is one that I took pictures of, but I'm gonna tell you everything that's on here, but I'm gonna tell you now that they probably are not gonna make you identify the blood vessels. Just to let you know. Um, in the past, when I set my labs up, I make people learn the vessels on them, but I'm gonna tell you what they are anyway, just in case. Your job is to go through the pre and post lab assignments. Focus on what you're learning in the pre post lab assignments and really what's in your engage lab manual to identify the anatomical parts. You can use my models book and the quizlets as a guide, but I probably will have more things labeled on the models than what you need to identify. So I, I can't go through and say we're omitting this and we're omitting that. It's kind of up to you to pull up these pictures and learn them and then look at your pre and post lab assignments, and really the engage lab manual. But I'm gonna go through and tell you some ma main features on the stomach with a couple of views. This is an anterior view of the stomach. So this is the lateral part of the stomach over here, your left lateral side, then a medial over here to the midline of your body going this way. So this is medial and this is lateral. So at the very top, we have the esophagus. Remember we're swallowing food through that. The part of the stomach where the esophagus joins to the stomach, just around it, just that little part around the esophagus is called the cardiac region. Some books just say the cardia. So it's called the cardiac region. The upper left bump of the stomach right here, which number 11 is really pointing to, this rounded area, that's the fundus of the stomach. Now we do have layers to the wall of the stomach. And I'm going to show you some of those layers on the intestinal model in a minute. But the layer that number 10 is pointing to is one of the muscle band layers. It's part of what's called the muscularis. This is the longitudinal muscle because it runs longitudinally with the stomach on this particular model. Right? Now, number four is pointing to the left gastric artery. Um, I'll show you that on the next picture as well. But also, if you notice, the stomach makes this J shape. So this smaller curvature right here, at number five, I drew this little kind of weird pointer, that's called the lesser curvature. Notice at the opposite end, there's a larger curve. Number nine is pointing to what's called the greater curvature. Now number seven is pointing to a part of the stomach called the pylorus. It's the very last part of the stomach before you get to the duodenum. And so the duodenum begins where I have pointer number six. So that's the very tip of the duodenum. This is the last part of the stomach. So that pyloric sphincter muscle is a circular muscle that would be right there inside there. And so when it opens, you enter the duodenum. This is a posterior view of the stomach. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. Number one and number eight are pointing to some arteries. I know they're not going to have that. Um, I just taught it, but... I'll tell you what they are anyway, if you're interested. There are some arteries that supply the stomach and the, the connective tissue sheets around the stomach, which are called uh, the mesenteries and omental tissues. And so number one is pointing to what's called the left gastro-omental artery, because it supplies the omentum and the, ga and the stomach gastric. Number eight is pointing to the right gastro-omental arteries, and they have all these little band, little artery branches that come off of them. So I doubt those are gonna be on there, but that's what they are, gastro-omental arteries. The left one up here, the left lateral side, 
the right one down here at the right medial side. Now this is the posterior view of the stomach. So now this is the lateral side on your left and this is the medial side on your right. This is the esophagus. The very end over here is pointing to the duodenum. So this is the very beginning of the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. Number six is pointing to that last part of the stomach just past the J shape. It's called the pylorus, generically. You have the lesser curvature and the greater curvature still. And then where this number four up here is pointing to that artery, you can see it a lot better if you look at it from the back, a little bit twisted and tilted over. This is the left gastric artery. In fact, we learned the artery that this branches off of for the last test, the celiac trunk, if you remember that. The celiac trunk has three branches to it. I don't know if I ever mentioned that to you, but the celiac trunk has three branches. One is a splenic artery, two is a left gastric artery, which this is, and then the hepatic artery. So there's three branches that come off that celiac trunk that we learned about for the first test. Now here's that same model with the top taken off and we can see some different structures in here, but really it's the same thing that I already mentioned. You have your esophagus, you had the lower esophageal sphincter, and you had the gastric rugae all in there, right? You have the lesser curvature and the greater curvature. Now just past this J-shaped bend, this part of the stomach in this triangular region, it is part of the pylorus, but it's specifically called the pyloric antrum. So the first part just past the, the bend in the stomach, our food is, is beginning to finalize its chemical digestion here. It's called the pyloric antrum. And well, it's called chyme, but it then moves into the last part of the pylorus, which it narrows down a little bit. That's called the pyloric canal. So then you see the little muscle right here. That would be a circular muscle that goes around. That's the pyloric sphincter muscle. All right, so the next couple of models are the pancreas models. Um, I do not think, I have to go and look, but I do not think you're gonna have to identify all the blood vessels, but I still wanna tell you what they are just in case. So ultimately what you're looking at here is what I used to call the small pancreas model, just because it has the pancreas and the duodenum and the spleen on it, relative to this model, which is a little bit larger, which I'll explain about this model in a minute. So this is the anterior view of the model. The stomach has been removed. So now we can see the pancreas. The pancreas has three parts to it. The part of the pancreas that lies next to and against the duodenum is called the head of the pancreas. So this part over here is the head. Then the middle part of the pancreas is just called the body, the body of the pancreas right here. And then over here, the part of the pancreas that anchors over near the spleen, this is the spleen, it's actually part of the lymphatic system. This part of the, the pancreas near the spleen is called the tail. So that's the tail of the pancreas. So you got the head, the body, and the tail. The duct in the middle, the large one, is called the pancreatic duct. Some books just call it the main pancreatic duct, but on the test you can just put pancreatic duct. There is a branch though right here. That little branch is another part of the duct, which means some pancreatic juice is secreted here into the duodenum. That's called the accessory pancreatic duct, All right? So let me show you some of these vessels. This artery that runs on the top of the pancreas is called the splenic artery because it's going over to the spleen. That's a splenic artery. This little artery right there, which sticks up, is this little artery that's sticking up right there, and that is the left gastric artery. So that's a left gastric. The next branch that we see over here is the common hepatic, or just what we call the hepatic artery, or the proper hepatic artery is the more accepted term as it's approaching the, the, the liver. So this is hepatic artery. If you put, if they have it and you put that, I, I would accept that. Then we have a special venule system that goes from the intestine 
to the liver and it's called the portal system. So number five is actually pointing to what's called the hepatic portal vein. The little green tube is a common bile duct. I know they probably won't have number seven or number nine, but I'm gonna tell you what those arteries are anyway. Um, this artery number seven is pointing to what's called the gastroduodenal, the gastroduodenal artery. And number nine is pointing to a, a name that students always hated. It's called the pancreatico duodenal artery. And everybody goes, huh? Well, pancreatico means pertaining to the pancreas and duodenal means pertaining to the duodenum. So this artery actually is supplying both tissues. So it's called the pancreatico duodenal artery. And there's actually uh, two main parts to it, a superior section and an inferior section. I just don't have it labeled on here. But nonetheless, the next two vessels that we see down here, the red one is a superior mesenteric artery, if you remember that name from the first test. Um, and the blue one is a superior mesenteric vein. Um, number 14 is pointing to the inferior mesenteric vein. So if we look at this model in a posterior view, we see all the same stuff except for one name. Everything's the same except for one name. You still have your duodenum right here. You have your common bile duct, the little green tube. Well, two names. Nope, that name was also on there. The common bile duct, the uh, hepatic portal vein right here. This is the superior mesenteric artery. This is the, uh, the hepatic artery or proper hepatic artery. Number seven, that little artery that goes up is a left gastric artery. Number eight is the celiac trunk. So that's new. And the other new one is this one, this vein that runs along the top of the pancreas. This is the splenic vein right here. So we have the celiac trunk and the splenic vein. This little vein that's coming up right here, that's the inferior mesenteric vein, and then you have your spleen over here. Now, when you're looking at the posterior side of this model, the head is now to your right, not to your left, like you're looking at the anterior view. So we just flipped it over. So to remember that, all you need to know is the head of the pancreas is always next to the duodenum. The tail of the pancreas is always next to the spleen. And then obviously the middle is just called the body, right? All right, now, this is another pancreas model. Um, there is a piece missing from it. So you're gonna see that piece on your pre and post lab assignments. Um, when I made this book, this was the only one of these models that I had in the lab at the time. And there's a little bitty square piece that fits right here with the gallbladder on it. And that little brown square piece you're gonna see in your assignments in, uh, in the module, that little square piece is a piece of the liver. And so the, the gallbladder is on that little square piece. It shows the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct along with the left and right hepatic ducts on that little bitty square piece. And you're gonna see it if you haven't done the assignment yet, make sure you, you do it so you can look at it and understand it. If you come across that model in one of your assignments and you don't understand it, shoot me a screenshot of it and I'll email you that. The rest of everything's pretty much the same. I just didn't have this little square piece on the model, it broke off. So you'll see what I'm talking about when you go and do those assignments. But nonetheless, you, you have your duodenum over here, you, uh, you have your pancreas, the stomach has been removed, you have the head of the pancreas by the duodenum, the body and the tail of the pancreas by the spleen. This model also includes the kidneys. This is a left kidney. This is a right kidney. And the adrenal glands, which sits on top of the kidneys, the left one and the right one. Um, the pancreatic duct you see in the middle. And then we have that accessory duct, that little branch. That little green thing is the common bile duct. And then on this model, you can see these two little openings. There's one, number seven is pointing to, here's one, number nine is pointing to. It makes a little bump where the tube enters the duodenum. You can't see them too well on the pictures of the small pancreas model, but on this one you can. So these little bumps are called the duodenal papillae. 
papilla singular, papilla plural. So the one at the top is where the accessory pancreatic duct is emptying its contents, a little bit of the pancreatic juice. That's called the minor duodenal papilla. Now where the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct join together right here, they empty out in this larger papilla. So this one's bigger. It's called the major duodenal papilla, right? And you still have your splenic artery right here, the gastroduodenal artery. You have your pancreatic duodenal artery over here between the pancreas and the duodenum, the superior mesenteric artery and vein. You still have that, right? We look at the back of it, the posterior view. You have your right and left kidneys, the left and right adrenal glands, the head of the pancreas, the body of the pancreas, the tail is over there. I know I'm pointing to the, a tube that's coming from the, the kidney right here, the ureter. That's technically part of the urinary system. If they make you learn it or on one of them pre and post lab assignments, fine. If not, don't worry about it. But ultimately that's a tube that carries urine away from the kidney down to your bladder. So you have a right one from the right kidney and you have a left one from the left kidney. You have an artery and a vein that enter and leave the kidney. So this is the right renal artery, right renal vein we learned about for the last test. And then we have the left ones over here. This little purple thing is the splenic vein. The red vessel on the top of the pancreas is always a splenic artery. The first branch up here is called the celiac trunk. The branch that's more inferior is called the superior mesenteric artery. And this purple one on this model is not the hepatopancreas, uh, I'm sorry, the hepatic portal vein. This, because they don't show the branching pattern, this is the superior mesenteric vein. So just, they cut it off. So just past this is where it would branch into what would become the hepatic portal vein. All right, this is the intestinal model. I know your brains are tired. We're almost dead. Just bear with me. Um, this is the intestinal model. And so we have to know the layers of the wall of the gastrointestinal tract. And so we use this intestinal model to show those layers. So this is a section taken out of the small intestine. Up here would be the apical area. So this would be the apical area of all the cells that form this non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium right here. And they're arranged in these finger-like projections, which are called villi. All right now this is the apical region up here of all those cells so this is what we would call the lumen of the intestine up here so the food is passing up here right so the first part of the where the epithelium is located always on these types of mucous membranes are called the mucosa so this first part up here that contains the epithelium with some blood vessels and whatnot and some areolar tissue down here. That's called the mucosa, right? We then have the area where we see some fat pad, a little bit, some fat in here. That's where the yellow is with some blood vessels, some lymphatic vessels and some components of the nervous system. That's all called the sub mucosa. It lies below the mucosa. Then we have the muscle layers. There's two bands of muscle that go down the, the tube. Um, there's a circular layer. So these bands go around this way, forms a circle. This inner band is the circular layer of the muscularis. So it's a circular muscle. And then this band runs along the length of the tube this way. That's called the longitudinal muscle layer. Collectively together, the muscle layer is just called the muscularis. The very bottom, where you see this yellow down here, is called the serosa. So this is the outside of the intestine. If you were touching the intestine from the outside, if I can find it. If we were touching that, touching it, touching it, touching it, touching it, touching it, from the outside, we would be touching the serosa. So that's what is represented by this line, right? 
Now, some of the other structures that are on here, we have these little green things that run inside of the villi are called the lacteals. They are blind ended lymphatic capillaries that are involved in absorbing fats from our diet. So all of the fats that we absorb from our diet go into the little green tube first, not the blood vessels. All of the other nutrients that we absorb go into the cardiovascular system, the capillaries first. So the fats go into the lymphatics, all your other nutrients go into your blood. We then have these little intestinal glands uh, that are involved in making some of those hormones and enzymes that we were talking about before. We have a little band of muscle tissue that is actually just underneath the mucosa, but before the submucosa. That's called the muscularis mucosa, a little bitty band of smooth muscle, muscularis mucosa. Then you have the, the larger arteries and veins. The red ones are arteries, the blue ones are veins. All of the little green things are lymphatic vessels. That's part of the lymphatic system. And then these little white nodules are part of the enteric nervous system that's involved in regulating aspects of digestion. And it's specifically called the myenteric plexus, right? The myenteric plexus. I didn't point to the nervous tissue up here that's in the submucosa, but that would be the submucosal plexus, right? So down here, this is called the myenteric plexus. Now, this is just the other side of the model. There's no front and back. I just labeled them A and B. Go ahead. Can you all still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Um, on, the, on, the other side of this, on the other side of this model, we pretty much have everything I just labeled except for this little green structure here. This is a part of the lymphatic system. It protects us against invading microbes if microbes enter through our mucosal lining. Um, this is called a lymphatic nodule. So you still have the villi, you still have lacteals, intestinal glands or pits, whatever I call them over there. Uh, the mucosa, uh, muscularis mucosa, so forth and so on, arteries and veins, all of that. So we still have that. I'm sorry, what did you say number nine is? Number nine? Oh, that's a lymphatic nodule. Okay, I just couldn't hear you, sorry. Okay, you all can hear me now? Yes. All right, very good. Yes, this is a lymphatic nodule. It's just a part of that model um, in there. All right, the last model that we have is our, a couple of liver models um, and pretty much identifying the same stuff on them. I just included them both in the book because in the past, um, we used to use this model because it had a gallstone in it right here, which was kind of interesting. But one of the students cured this person of gallstones and uh, you know removed it from here. You know, I didn't find that funny. Yeah, so anyway, one of the students broke it off. Anyway, this we used to use this one just basically to show the gallstone, but I left it in to show a slightly different consistency of the model relative to this one. This one has all of the arteries and veins and the hepatic ducts flowing all in here. So it's kind of confusing. That's why I point to the lobes on the edge. So let's just go over the model. The largest lobe of the liver is this lobe. It's the right lobe of the liver. It, it lies on the right lateral side of your body in the abdominal cavity. Um, this number six is pointing to the left lobe, which is the second largest lobe on the liver. We have two other lobes that we have to identify. They're much smaller, but they're still lobes that we have to identify. Uh, one of them up here, which is actually the posterior part of the liver, by the way, because this liver would be tilted downward towards us anatomically. Uh, in our body because this is the inferior vena cava. So we're actually looking at the liver as if someone is lying down on their stomach and looking at it up through their, their abdominal cavity. So um, the, this would have to be twisted downward in order to be in an anatomical position. But nonetheless, this lobe up here that's next to the inferior vena cava is called the caudate lobe with a C, caudate. And then we have this lobe which is next to the gallbladder and a falciform ligament. That's called the quadrate lobe, the quadrate lobe, right? So then you have the gallbladder, which is next to it. Nobody ever misses that. Now, number two is pointing to the green tube that leads away from the gallbladder, 
That tube is always called the cystic duct. And what you can't see, see all these little green tubes from this side and all the little green tubes from this side, all of these little biliary ducts or tubes form what we call the hepatic duct. So we would have all of these converge to form one left hepatic duct. We have all of these form that converge together to form one right hepatic duct. And where they join together behind here would be a common hepatic. Now we can't see it, but it would be behind there. Where the common hepatic comes up and joins with this cystic duct. From this point forward, that would be called the common bile duct. It's just cut off. And then you have the hepatic artery, and this purple one right here is the hepatic portal vein. Same thing on this liver, except it's the falciform ligaments not colored in. You have the right lobe of the liver over here. You have the left lobe of the liver. You have the caudate lobe, inferior vena cava. This vein now is not the hepatic portal vein, but it's, it's the renal vein. I mean, not renal, it's the hepatic vein because it's gonna branch into the, into the inferior vena cava. The red one is the hepatic artery. So right lobe, left lobe, caudate lobe. This lobe down here by the gallbladder and the falciform ligament is the quadrate lobe. So that's not too bad as far as that model's concerned. Now, the rest of this chapter has my specific slides that I used in lab. I don't think they use these particular slides on your pre and post lab assignments, but there are some things that I want to mention. The liver is identifiable. This is a slide of the liver. I think the picture that you're going to be looking at is a little bit more magnified. Um, they have all these little squiggly lines in it. Those are little sinusoids in there and the liver is sectioned into little circular regions that go around a, what's called a central vein. So this would be a circular region. We can see it better if we had the microscope physically in front of us. Um, and those are called lobules. So that would be one around that central vein. There would be one around this central vein, so forth and so on, all right? So that is one of the identifying characters, that central vein right there. Um, we looked at the pancreas all, uh, already in the endocrine chapter. We were identifying the pancreatic islets, but for this test, we're not too much concerned about the islets, although they are an identifying character. You're more concerned with the rest of the cells and not the little circles, but the rest of the cells are the acini cells that make the pancreatic enzymes. This is a slide I like to use in the lab. I don't think they have the slide, um, but this was a longitudinal slide of where the esophagus meets the stomach. And so the identifying characters here, just to let you know, is the mucosal lining. The tissue that lines your esophagus right there, if you follow my pointer, is kind of thick, right? That is a non-keratinized stratified squamous right there. So you can see how thick that epithelial lining is relative to this side over here, you can't really even see anything. Real thin, kind of goes up and down a little bit. That's because those are cuboidal and columnar cells over there, a, a simple sheet of them. So this is a stratified squamous. That's a simple epithelium on that side. So this is the esophagus side, this is the, is the stomach side. And in this area going around this way would be the esophageal sphincter muscle, which we can't see. So I used to use this in lab to learn about the esophageal mucosa and the gastric mucosa on that slide. Um, this is a slide of the small intestine. These large finger-like projections that we just looked at a model, those are called the villi. Those are the finger-like projections. Um, so that's part of the mucosal lining. We have the submucosa, which is represented by this blue. You have the muscularis layer right there, little bands of smooth muscle. And the very outer part would be the serosa. So I, unless they give you a very magnified view of this, you may have to uh, identify these layers like you did on that model. And then you have the salivary gland uh, histology slides. This one happens to be specifically the submandibular gland in cross-section. Um, there's a couple of different types of cells in here. That's why we see lighter pinks and darker purples 
um, and some adipose tissue in here. These cells produce different consistencies of substances for the saliva that this gland is making. Um, some of these produce more mucus, some of them produce more enzymes and water. But nonetheless, you're not gonna have to identify the specific cell in there, but you will have to be able to recognize it as a salivary gland. And I put a circle right around a duct from the salivary gland right there. So that's one of the identifying characters. Besides you seeing uh, lighter pinks and darker pinks on purples in there, salivary gland. And then as far as the, the colon is concerned, they may have an up close picture of it without this little nodule in here. This is a particular slide that I specifically used in my labs. Um, I always like to focus down on this region because in the submucosa where, and, and, and just below the mucosa, we see this lymphatic nodule. And it was one of the identifying characters there uh, for students to identify it. Uh, but you can see the mucosal lining, epithelial lining um, of the uh, colon quite well up here. That's a simple uh, non-ciliated columnar epithelium up there as well. So you probably will see that a lot better because their histology slide, I think, is more magnified than that. But that's pretty much the slides. Um, again, so let me stop sharing this.